The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Uh, welcome to our witnesses. This hearing is entitled, quote, Pathways to Opportunity, Lessons from Kenosha. Before we get into uh, opening statements, I'd like to seek unanimous consent to recognize for two minutes a student um, here at the university, uh, Ms. Allison Anguiano Salas, uh, who is a senior. Uh, Ms. Uh, Anguiano Salas, you're recognized for two minutes. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, as it was stated, my name is Allison Angiano Salas. She, her, her pronouns. I want to welcome everyone here to Kenosha. I have the honor of serving as student body president here at AW Parkside along with other leadership roles. I'm currently a senior who will be graduating in May with a major in English and political science with a law concentration and a minor in Spanish. I'm excited that you all are getting to learn more about UW Parkside and Southeast Wisconsin. Thank you, Congress members, for coming to Kenosha to learn more about our community and hear from community members and students firsthand. I also want to thank the Select Committee for choosing to hold the hearing at UW Parkside. You will hear more about the opportunities offered here at UW Parkside from our chancellor, as well as the partnerships in Southeast Wisconsin that are striving to help our community members. Today is a unique experience for students and community members here in Kenosha and Southeast Wisconsin. House committee hearings usually take place in Washington, D.C., nearly 800 miles away. Many people never get to travel to D.C. and experience a congressional hearing. It is important that we as students are involved in the community and government, and we should not be afraid to reach out to our elected officials with our concerns and matters that are important to us. Again, thank you for coming, and for those who are visiting UW Parkside for the first time or are visiting us once again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Anguiano Salas. I, I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. And I want to begin by offering a huge thanks to the University of Wisconsin at Parkside uh, and to my two colleagues from the state of Wisconsin on my left and on my right um, for uh, organizing and hosting this really important hearing. Uh, this is a subset of the Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth. Our uh, committee was uh, put together for the purpose of understanding the fact that as time goes by, it becomes increasingly challenging for an increasingly large number of Americans to live the American dream, to know with some confidence that they will do better than their parents' generation did. And this is anything but a geographically specific problem. I happen to come from the East Coast and represent a very affluent district in, in Fairfield County, Connecticut. But in my affluent district of Fairfield County, Connecticut, are urban communities like Bridgeport. Bridgeport, which is a city which bears some commonality with some of the deindustrialization that we've seen in the Midwest. Bridgeport was, in World War I, known as the, the arsenal of democracy in that it produced more armaments to win the First World War than any other geography on the planet. Today, most of those uh, industries are gone, uh, and that community struggles um, with issues of poverty, with malnutrition, and with a challenged educational system. The, um, is, uh, the problem is also far from a partisan one. Economic disparity is demonstrated in deep blue districts, in deep red districts, and in purple districts. And so what this committee is, is doing, and I'm delighted to be doing it in, in partnership with all of my uh, colleagues, but also in particular with Ranking Member Brian Stile, um, whose uh, congressional district we now sit in, is to uh, float solutions, to float solutions in a serious, analytical, and bipartisan way. We, we make no um, mistake that the two parties will, of course, differ over those solutions, but we are determined to find those solutions that might draw bipartisan support. Like it or not, in the United States Congress, if something is to become law, it almost certainly needs to attract support from both sides of the aisle. And though we are very proud of our respective parties and our values and our philosophies, we're conscious of the fact that to make progress, you need to have more people interested, more people supportive, rather than fewer people. So um, I do want, once again, want to say thank you uh, to our witnesses. Um, we really look forward to your testimony. We've already had a big day um, meeting students um, earlier in a very informal way and a lunch in which we heard from community leaders and others about some of the remarkable work that is being done uh, in this part of the country. Uh, so again, I thank our witnesses and thank uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin at uh, Parkside. Um, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, the ranking member, for five minutes of opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding the hearing today. 
uh, in the state of Wisconsin. I think it's a real opportunity that doesn't happen enough uh, for Congress to actually pause and listen. Uh, it's my grandma's 98th birthday. I started the, the morning in Janesville uh, with pancakes instead of cake, pancakes and coffee. Uh, and she would always tell me, you have two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion. Uh, and today is a little bit of an opportunity for Congress to do just that. Uh, some of the dysfunction we see in Washington is, I think, far too often Congress doesn't listen uh, to the American people to be able to try to actually solve some of the challenges uh, that we face. I think today we have a really unique opportunity uh, to look at the microcosm here uh, in Kenosha and in Racine about the challenges we face, but also about the opportunities uh, that we have and what is the role of uniquely the federal government uh, in remedying some of the challenges, uh, in leveraging some of the opportunities is we all know in this room, but not everybody across the country knows, is how resilient of a community Kenosha is. In many ways, it reminds me of my hometown of Janesville, uh, having gone through uh, both a robust development of their industrial base, but also a punch in the face, uh, is some of those largest employers left town, uniquely uh, in Kenosha being Chrysler, uh, the impact that that has had. Uh, for many in our nation, uh, they know Kenosha, unfortunately, because of three horrific nights. Uh, but Kenosha, as we know, that is one page uh, in the book uh, of a long book uh, and chapters yet to unfold. And I think we actually see here uh, in Kenosha the opportunities that make not only our community so great, but our country so strong. Uh, and we have an opportunity to hit, to hit head on what are the challenges that we face, in particular uh, our workforce needs. How do we address the fact that there are jobs that are, being, that are available? yet workers looking for work, and that disconnect between the skill sets uh, and the preparation that individuals in our community have against the jobs that are becoming available, often along the I-94 corridor, as we think from the state line uh, to the Milwaukee airport, uh, and where some of our uh, individuals who are looking for work who often still remain uh, downtown uh, in some spectacular cities, but where the jobs now have shifted away. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to address and discuss that labor mismatch head on. Uh, we have some of our education leaders here uh, who will be discuss discussing that. We'll have success stories with us here today discussing that, and also the role of the private sector that that plays in our community, making sure that there are good family-sustaining jobs uh, available in our communities. As we look at Gateway Technical College, the first public technical college in the United States of America, with its foundings beginning when farmers here in southeast Wisconsin uh, were moving into cities such as Racine or Kenosha at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and they needed different skills and preparation to take on those industrial jobs and they may have developed uh, in the early days working in the farms. As we look to the shift that we're seeing right now in our country's economy, we're in a similar turning point where some of the industrial jobs that generations ago left a farm to come in to work for, some of those jobs have now departed our, our area or have been automated. And now we're in more of a knowledge economy. And what can we be doing to make sure that we're preparing at, the, at the, the primary and secondary education school, in our technical colleges, in our four-year universities, to make sure that students have the preparation and the skills to be able to take advantage of those jobs? whether or not that's preparing somebody as, late, as, as early as in their high school years to be a welder, an electrician, a plumber, whether or not it's getting them coding skills so they can go into a high-tech job, or whether or not it's somebody who's taking a path to a four-year university degree uh, here at Parkside who's going to go on to medical school and address the next uh, public health crisis uh, that we ultimately face. And so I think we just have an incredibly unique opportunity. Kenosha uh, has hit some hard times. It's been a really difficult two years in particular, uh, not only for three challenging nights in Kenosha, uh, but also over the course of a, uh, a global pandemic that impacted all of us here at well, as well. But we also have some of the most unique opportunities. We have one of the best workforces, uh, not only in the country, but in the world. And I hear that time and again as employers are locating here uh, in Kenosha and Racine County. Uh, they're here because we have the best workers anywhere there are, anywhere in the world. We just have to make sure that we address, in particular, uh, this labor challenge and this labor mismatch to make sure that all Americans, that every citizen, that everyone here in Kenosha, everyone here in Racine has the opportunity to really benefit from the 
from the economic growth that we've continued to see and what can we do to further accelerate that growth. And so I couldn't be more excited that we're holding this hearing here today uh, in Kenosha County. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate uh, your willingness to come and uh, listen because I think there are some amazing lessons that we can learn from Kenosha that we can share with the country. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Um, before we turn to our witnesses, I ask for unanimous, unanimous consent from the members to play a brief video. Uh, the committee has developed a quirky habit of uh, starting every hearing with four minutes of testimony from folks that are just out there, not necessarily in the formality of the setting, but uh, ask for unanimous consent to play the video. Um, let's go ahead and run it. Almost immediately, the apprenticeship prepares you um, for the job you're currently doing. Uh, the first thing you'd start out with is safety week, and who doesn't want a carpenter who's safe out there every day? Uh, there was no prep. I actually just enrolled into the apprenticeship with zero, zero skills. I had no idea what I was doing, but the apprenticeship um, actually gave me those skills, and through training, I was able to become a well-rounded, better carpenter. As soon as you're in the apprenticeship, you start on a job site. Um, regardless if you went to your first class or not, you are the new apprentice. They know you're going through training. Um, you do your training throughout the four-year period, uh, and everything is like together. So you, you, you get paid immediately. You kind of go at your own ability. Your instructor comes, checks on how you're doing, uh, gives you tips to how to better improve what you're doing, and then uh, you take that out to the field with you. My line of work is important. Um, it is the, the infrastructure of the United States is, is based off of laborers. It's based off of union workers. It's based off of the guys who are down there in the trenches um, getting the stuff done, B building the infrastructure of the United States. It's, it's important stuff. Um, we're not just guys to look down on. Uh, you know, we, we help improve the nation. Three years ago, I didn't have no hope. I had no hope. I had no desire. I had no ambition. I had no goals. I had no plans. I have nothing. I didn't know what to do. Ever since I've been in this program, I have got myself back. I made that transition because I had went to jail for a few months. I really had to sit myself down and figure out what was best for me as a single parent with no help. I went to my community workforce and they had some programs on there saying so seven week trades that I could take. So every day I'm just learning since I've been there because I didn't know nothing about no screwdriver, no drill, none of that. I've never even used that a day in my life. You go fresh out of high school and go get a trade. You're going to be, you know, set yourself up for life at, <laughs> at an early age. I'm 31 with three kids, and I graduated from high school in 2009. It's 10 years later, and I just figured out what I wanted to do in my life. Being an electrician has brought me so much stability in my life, so much discipline for me and my daughters. My strength definitely came from my oldest daughter, and I just got her back in January. She's been taking out my care since September of 2018. I enjoy what I do. I wake up, and I look forward to going to work. I am wiring residential work. I am wiring um, sockets. I am doing temp lights and I'm breaking nails. <laughs> I was nervous because I was the only woman on the field, on the field. but now it's like, <laughs> I'm Queen C. <laughs> Miss Hollywood, whatever they call me, I got all pink tools. Like, I look forward to going to work. Like, I just feel so welcome and I feel so loved. There's a lot of resources and they are here to help you. You just got to go find them. I'm definitely living the American dream, and it feels good, <laughs> and it feels lovely. Okay, thank you again. Um, now we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. First, we have Dr. Debbie Ford, Chancellor of University of Wisconsin Parkside, and our host here today. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, next, we will hear from Ms. Lindsay Bloomer, President and CEO of WRTP Big Step. We will then hear from Mr. Diego Ruiz, the Vice President of Global Government Relations for SC Johnson. Next, we have Dr. Brian Albrecht, 
president of Gateway Technical College. And lastly, we will hear from Ms. Sherry Carrion of the Gateway Technical College. She's a, a graduate of Gateway Technical <coughs> College. Um, witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer somewhere, somewhere in front of you uh, <coughs> that will indicate how much you time you have left. I would ask that you be mindful of the timer and when the timer reaches zero to quickly wrap up your testimony so that we can be respectful both of the other witnesses and the committee members' time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Dr. Ford, you are now recognized for five minutes for an oral presentation of your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, and Congr Congresswoman Moore. Welcome to Southeastern Wisconsin, the most diverse region of our state, and what is today an epicenter of vibrant economic growth. I am proud to be Chancellor here at UW Parkside, representing more than 4,500 students, over 27,000 alumni, and a remarkably talented faculty and staff. Welcome to UW Parkside, and join me in thanking all of those who made today's hosting of this congressional hearing possible. UW Parkside has been transforming lives for more than 50 years. When I talk with our alumni, their stories often start with, if not for Parkside. Since our founding, our student body has reflect, reflected the diversity of the communities we serve. More than 50% of our students identify as first-generation students, 31% of our students identify as underrepresented minorities, and 17% identify as Latinx, UW Parkside is Wisconsin's only public four-year university recognized as an emerging Hispanic serving institution. 38% of our degree-seeking undergraduates rely on the Pell Grant, and without this valuable federal financial aid program, they would not be able to pursue a degree. We all agree that education is one of the keys to transforming lives. Historically, Kenosha and Racine have been centers of innovation. To continue this trend, our region needs more graduates. That's why we have set a bold goal to increase the number of graduates by 50% by 2025. How are we doing? Well, during the global pandemic, we have actually had the largest graduating classes in our history, and based on projections for May, it looks like another record-setting class of graduates here at UW Parkside. On a national scale, with our partners, Carthage College, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and Milwaukee Area Technical College, we formed the nation's first regional consortium to eliminate equity gaps in higher education by 2030 with EAB's Moonshot for Equity. What we do here at UW Parkside is all about partnerships, and we actively seek input from our regional employers as we look to modify, add, and design our academic programs. Proud to report that we have modified or added or changed our programs over 40 different programs in the past several years. But our curriculum here at UW Parkside remains responsive and market relevant, and the outcomes are amazing. 89% of our health sciences graduates are accepted into professional schools, including going to medical school. We offer the only AACSB accredited competency-based Bachelor of Science in Business known as the Flex BSBA. And this enrolls over 200 adult learners in this very innovative program. And we are expanding dual enrollment offerings so that more students in KUSD and RUSD can earn college credit while in high school. Responsive and quality academic programs coupled with experiential learning opportunities across the curriculum ensure that our graduates are ready for the emerging needs in today's global knowledge economy. One of the things that we certainly strive to do is through the strategic partnerships that we have with K-12 schools, higher ed institutions, elected officials, nonprofit organizations, and business and industry. And you certainly heard us talk about the, the value of partnerships in our region during our lunch today. I want to share one example of such a partnership, and that is the partnership we have with Gateway Technical College. Our partnerships that we have between Parkside and Gateway are recognized in the state as innovative and forward thinking. In October of this past year, the UW Board of Regents approved a first of its kind academic pathway that allows Gateway and Parkside to offer the Associate of Arts and Associate of Science degrees. 
We are looking forward to having more students start at Gateway and then finish that four-year degree here at UW Parkside. We, we are the innovators, the educators, and leaders who are transforming lives and preparing for what is on the horizon. One of the challenges for all institutions of higher education is to ensure that student success is as diverse as our student population. At UW Parkside, we continue to work with student groups and community organizations to better understand the needs and challenges of underrepresented populations. The goal is to create a learning community where all students have equitable opportunities to succeed and we're eliminating barriers to providing these transformative learning opportunities. We are committed to this charge because we recognize that a university education is crucial to building equity in a competitive 21st century global economy. Thank you so much for your committee's recognition of the importance of higher education in these conversations, and I look forward to your questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Ms. Bloomer, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairperson Himes, Representative Style, Representative Moore, and honorable members of the committee. Today, we're facing a near crisis of the number of skilled laborers and artisans in the workforce. During the lockdown of 2020, we saw people across America come together to creatively support their local restaurants and shops, demonstrating that we as a community value the artisan and entrepreneur's contribution to the quality of our lives. As the world reopens, now is the time to make large-scale investments in those skilled workers whose crafts can profoundly improve our health, close environmental justice gaps, and create a new generation of craftspeople. Investments like the ones advanced by the bipartisan infrastructure law bolster America's infrastructure and repay us in dividends for generations when connected to thoughtful workforce development efforts that include talent pipeline development that focus on truly true diversity and equity efforts and work in tandem with higher education and technical education pathways. Since the early 1990s, WRTP has created and implemented successful models of pre-employment and occupational training designed for underrepresented populations seeking employment in construction, manufacturing, and emerging sectors. We serve thousands of individuals a year, just like Charnel in the video, nearly 70% of whom identify as a person of color, and nearly a third have been justice involved. We do this work in tandem with partners in technical and higher education through related technical instruction or customized training opportunities. Yet our work offers an alternative four-year degree. That is a debt-free pathway to a family-sustaining career, registered apprenticeship. Our fellow skilled trade union brothers and sisters who for generations have made private investments in developing a qualified workforce through apprenticeship have built modern skyscrapers and tackled the less glamorous challenge of holding together an aging infrastructure. Now is the time to make an investment in the systems that provided an opportunity for so many Americans in the 70s and 80s to enjoy a solidly middle-class life without post-secondary student loan debt, all while improving quality of life for everyone in our community. To achieve these goals, we must connect more people of color to pre-apprenticeships and registered apprenticeships while providing the supports necessary to see them through these journeys. WRTP Big Step has proudly worked with leaders for decades to put measures in place that help ensure that contractors and unions train and employ people from our most economically challenged neighborhoods. When this work is funded and done with intention, we've seen how it changes lives. The infusion of skilled talent, family-sustaining wage careers, and an appreciation for safe, quality, and aesthetically beautiful spaces transforms neighborhoods. Registered apprenticeship is critical to the tight labor market today. It is equitable, fair, and one of the best pathways to family-sustaining wages and creation of generational wealth. Our model at WRTV Big Step of pathways to and through apprenticeship assists people in creating a clear plan to skills training, which is often the first step to our most traditionally disenfranchised populations. Our North American Building Trades Union's Multi-Craft Core Curriculum is an improved construction training program, and our Manufacturing Skills Standards Council Curriculum is an improved manufacturing training program, both of which are supported by tutoring and support services. These certified curricula provide the first step, the first credential that someone can use immediately on the job and start to structure a career through registered apprenticeship. These credentials can even be used to enter technical education or higher education farther into their work journey. WRTP Big Step is proud to be a certified training provider in both the MC3 and MSSC. Not only do we conduct these first step trainings for adults and youth, we also pair these with the high school equivalency degree so students can earn both at the same time. We also work with the Department of Corrections to conduct these credential trainings in both youth and adult correctional facilities. 
These credentials flow directly into registered apprenticeship and provide the necessary education and skills to meet today's labor market demands. Entering a registered apprenticeship is much like entering college. There are requirements and benchmarks to be met. Apprenticeship is a long and steadfast model within our industry, and it has served us well. We are glad that new industries and sectors are adopting this model and earn as you learn approach. And it's encouraging that we have public officials at the table advocating for this talent development strategy. Registered apprenticeship should not be a best kept secret or viewed as inferior to other educational pathways. In fact, it combines three to five years of technical education and on the job training and provides a springboard to a journey person's card which is recognized and respected by unions, employers, technical colleges, and other educational institutions across the United States, and all of this at no cost to the apprentice. We need to ensure long-term secure employability, and a journey person's card simply has the genuine promise of delivering on it. As a player at the workforce development table doing this work every day, we know we must work toward the real impact we all want to have, so that collectively we can begin to make good on the promise of registered apprenticeship and the promise of opportunity for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bloomer. Mr. Ruiz, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, Congresswoman Moore, thank you very much for convening this hearing. My name is Diego Ruiz. I am Vice President for Global Government Relations at SC Johnson, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today on behalf of our company. Founded in 1886 and headquartered just up the road in Racine, Wisconsin, SC Johnson believes that a more sustainable, healthier, and transparent world that inspires people and creates opportunities isn't just possible, it is our responsibility. A heritage of innovation and bold, transparent decisions is why our high-quality products and iconic brands, including Off, Raid, Glade, Windex, Scrubbing Bubbles, Ziploc, Mrs. Myers, and many more, are in homes, schools, and businesses in virtually every country worldwide. As a global purpose-led company, we are committed to making the world a better place today and for future generations. That means relentlessly bringing our expertise in science, innovation, and partnerships to bear on some of the world's most pressing environmental and health issues, like reducing plastic waste and eradicating malaria. Around the world, we use our resources to unlock greater economic and educational opportunities for people and communities where access may be limited, but curiosity and potential are limitless. SC Johnson has a long history of working to create opportunities for people in the communities where we live and work, especially right here in southeast Wisconsin. We recognize that by helping carve new pathways to economic and social mobility, we are able to improve the lives of individuals and their families. We believe education is at the core of opportunity, and widening access to education has been and will continue to be a significant focus area for our company. To support these endeavors, we've partnered with several, several organizations represented on this panel, including Gateway Technical College and the University of Wisconsin Parkside, to develop programs that provide individuals with the education and skills needed to meet evolving workforce needs and find family-sustaining careers. This includes improving access to STEM education, supporting job and vocational training programs, and preparing young people in underrepresented communities for a potential future in science and technology. As one of the largest employers in Southeast Wisconsin, we are acutely aware of the workforce and hiring challenges facing manufacturers today. These challenges, which have become more apparent over the past three years due in large part to the pandemic, fall into four key areas. Number one, there is an increased demand on the local labor pool that outpaces the current supply. Number two, there is a lack of availability of local production, technical, and trades resources. <clears throat> Number three, employee recruitment and retention drivers are not keeping pace relative to employment choices. And number four, technology changes are resulting in steep learning curve requirements. These challenges are not unique to SC Johnson, but are being felt by employers across the nation. As the older generations age out of the workforce, we are starting to see increased employee turnover, a gap in institutional knowledge, and the need to train the younger generations in the skills needed to compete and succeed in today's workforce. To address these challenges, we have leaned into the relationships that we have built with our local community, including Gateway Technical College and the local high schools, and continue to advocate for programs focused on encouraging and incentivizing trade skills. 
These programs, along with internships and apprenticeships, provide tailored instruction that equip the students with the skills necessary to set them up for success in the workforce of today and tomorrow. The work and investments of employers and educators alone, however, won't help close the skills and employment gap. We thank the members of this committee for their support of this year's appropriations package, which included additional funding for work, workforce development, funding which is critical to helping local communities reinstate trades-oriented classes and training programs that provide pathways for placement in manufacturing roles. There are also a number of equally important macro factors that greatly influence a manufacturer's ability to grow and thrive, which ultimately is the only way to create jobs and opportunity and sustain them over time. It is vital to have a competitive tax system that doesn't disadvantage American businesses against foreign companies. Also, trade policies that seek to open foreign markets and eliminate unfair barriers abroad to U.S. goods and services and smart regulation that works to protect worker safety, public health, and our environment without creating unnecessary red tape that increases costs. We believe it's very important for Congress to bear in mind how these factors impact our ability to compete in the global market and thereby create opportunities here at home. S.E. Johnson is committed to laying the groundwork today to support the workforce of tomorrow. Thank you, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Stile, and Congresswoman Moore for convening this important hearing and giving S.E. Johnson the opportunity to share our views. We commit to continuing to work with you on this important topic, and I look forward to responding to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Dr. Albrecht, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hines and Ranking Member Style, and of course, uh, Congresswoman Glenda Moore. Glad to have you in our community today. Appreciate the opportunity to share just a few thoughts with you. My comments today rest on the shoulders of our faculty, staff, professional administration, of course, our students. They are the real story for what we can represent in our community. I want to start by thanking Congressman Stile for that brief history of Gateway Technical College. It was a solution and an innovation in 1911, just as it is today. So within my context of my stories, you'll hear about partnerships where we have woven in solutions where we think we can better address the needs of, of community members today. Gateway is one of 16 technical colleges in the state of Wisconsin with a focus and a direct mission on workforce preparation. But as an advocate for higher education and the economic opportunities it provides for all of our graduates, I'm proud of our collaboration with UW Parkside, with Carthage College, with Herzing, and with all the institutions in the Higher Education Regional Alliance. This is a strategy that is going to help elevate the visibility of the advances of higher education by that network of professionals. I have no doubt that each one of our institutions would put student success and the possibilities of a rewarding and fulfilling career at the top of any of their graduation outcome lists. Today, I'm sharing you a story of one, Gateway Technical College, filled now with 111 years of great stories, individual by individual. We're dedicated to the service of three counties, Racine, Kenosha, and Walworth County. Our vision states it best. We make life-changing edu educational opportunities a reality. Our mission assures the alignment with workforce needs with a local opportunity. We deliver industry-focused education that's flexible, accessible, affordable for a diverse community. In that regard, I'll share with you just three of the effective partnerships that meet your objectives today. First is a partnership that serves as a model being replicated in over 1,000 schools and colleges throughout the nation. Snap-on Incorporated and their CEO, Nick Pinchuk, has served as a national champion for the value of technical education and the dignity of work. Gateway and Snap-on have partnered to establish the National Coalition of Certification Centers to advance the alignment of curriculum, in schools with needs in transportation, energy, and the manufacturing sectors. This work culminates with a nationally recognized certification, adding value to the academic preparation of our students. To date, over 100,000 certificates have been awarded, increasing the capabilities of the automotive industry and advancing careers for certified technicians. Local automotive dealers throughout southeast Wisconsin, like the Palman Group, Lynch Automotive and Truck, Kunis Country Automotive, are just a few of the employers that have benefited from this direct student engagement. The second example comes from Walworth County. Mike Reeder, the CEO of Precision Plus, has made it his passion to strengthen the technical capabilities of schools, teachers, and students. Sponsoring Gateway's RPM Manufacturing Center on our Elkhorn campus has led to student internships, apprenticeships, and a variety of work-based learning opportunities. Mike and his team are directly engaged with our faculty to ensure that students are not only well-prepared, but connected to area employers to address the regional manufacturing workforce shortage. And lastly, I'll highlight an exceptional partnership with S.E. Johnson Corporation, of which you'll hear just a little bit more about from our student. 
Gateway Technical College and SC Johnson have been partnering to address the employment and economic conditions of Racine County for many years. In this short testimony, I can only cover a few of the highlights, and then one of our graduates, Sherry Carrion, will share the impact of such partnerships. Fisk Johnson, Chairman and CEO of SC Johnson, has made a commitment to improving the lives of citizens in the communities and the communities around the world in which they do business. Our history runs deep with customized training programs for incumbent workers, short-term boot camp training for dislocated individuals, high school academies to address critical workforce needs like smart manufacturing, IT, STEM scholars, and so on. The Promise Program, initially funded with S.E. Johnson support, helps to address the affordability and access of high-skilled pr uh, programs for students. And the HOPE Scholarship Program, probably the most influential program we had during COVID and pandemic. The HOPE standard stands for High Skilled Occupationals for Professional Employment, or HOPE for short. The HOPE program was specifically intended for dislocated workers due to the pandemic. HOPE provided funding and support and short-term training programs that were identified as critical to the business needs of our community. Dislocated food service workers, for example, into healthcare jobs, as, it, as an example. This program not only provides the skilled training, but the necessary support services to acquire and maintain a new career. Equipping students with skills in our community's resources serves as a foundation for career and family success. There's so much more that I could tell you about the college and the communities that we serve, but I believe it's more important that you hear from one of our graduates. Sherry is proof that Gateway lives up to its name as a gateway to hope and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht. Uh, and lastly, Ms. Carrion, you are now recognized for five minutes. Honorable Ranking Member uh, Mr. Steele, Steele. <laughs> I'm so nervous. <laughs> Take your time. All right. So my name is Sherry Carrion, and I have lived in Racine all of my life. And I've been in food service about 30 years. I graduated from Gateway 1987. And then the pandemic hit. Oh, boy, did it hit hard. Um, and food service was one of the things that was hit the hardest. Everything was shutting down. And I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Um, previous to that, though, my father died in 2019. He was in a nursing home and not getting very good care. And so those two things were on my mind. Um, the loss of the food service, the loss of my father. So I put it out on Facebook and I thought, I need a new job. So I was thinking food service, but I wasn't for sure. And then um, someone says, well, how about being a caregiver? And I thought, being a caregiver, oh my goodness. I never did that before, but you know what? The pandemic taught me to step out of the box. So I stepped out of the box. I became a caregiver. And, one, and it was part-time, making $13 an hour. And... Um, my office manager sent out an email and said, Sherry, I think you could um, apply for this and qualify for this. It's a whole program. You could go to Gateway and um, get a certificate in, uh, nurse, to be a nursing assistant. And I said, me? Go back to school? I graduated in 87 from Gateway. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to divorce Netflix. <laughs> And the school was online. Oh, my goodness. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to give this a try. I am going to give this a try. If she thinks I can do it, then I'm going to do it. Sure enough. I took the class online. It was shortened because of the pandemic. So I, I, took, I, I um, took the class online. Well, I applied for the grant. I was accepted. And then I thought, oh, my goodness. How am I going to do the clinicals? I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to take off work. I can't afford to do that, and I'm going to have to pay for a uniform. Oh my gosh, where am I going to get the money for that? Well, we showed up for class at Gateway, and the Hope program not only paid the tuition, but the Hope program also paid us for taking the program. So I thought, oh my goodness, thank God. So paid for my two days off, my um, uniform plus. 
So I was very grateful for that. I am grateful for that. Um, and I had a wonderful instructor, Sarah, and she, she was so helpful, so, so helpful. So there you have it. I graduated at 87 with an associate degree. I just graduated last May with a nursing assistance uh, program. I am now working full time. I still have the same office manager, Amy Malat, and she still continues to inspire me and empower me. And so does Gateway and so does Essie Johnson. And I am so grateful, so grateful. Because if it wasn't for them, I don't know what I would have done. I don't, I really don't know. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karen. So we've got, we've, what, what we're going to do initially here, we've got three members, so ordinarily when we've got lots and lots of members popping in and out, it gets, it gets the timing gets awkward, but we're going to do at least two rounds of five minutes each of the three members up here, and then we'll sort of uh, reconvene and see whether it makes sense to move on from that. But um, I will uh, recognize myself now um, for five minutes of questions. And, and um, my question goes um, to Dr. Ford and doc, Dr. Albrecht, and then Ms. Carey, and I'm going I'm to ask you to, to play clean up here and, and, and tell me if they answered the question right. Um, to our educational leaders, um, we've got wonderful uh, community colleges in my district, and they, they work wonderfully. They have low graduation rates. Why? Because oftentimes those folks that are trying to get a foothold into, on the economic ladder, they've got kids they need to take care of. They've got jobs that are not flexible. Uh, sometimes it's just a plain money problem. So I may, just ask you to reflect for maybe a minute each, and then Ms. Carriona is going to grade you on, on whether, whether, whether you're right in the way, whether you're accurate in what you say. What Apart from the excellence of your institutions, what could we do at any level, municipally, state, federal, to support um, struggling students best? Maybe we'll start with Dr. Ford. I was going to start with Dr. Albrecht. All right, we'll start with Dr. Albrecht. I'd be happy to. Thank you. So first, um, thank you, Sherry, for that story. It is compelling to remind ourselves that each of us must be willing to reinvent ourselves as the economy changes and when there are opportunities out there to take advantage of them. Some of the big challenges that we face right now with our students are mental health. Investments in mental health at the college level would be very much appreciated and I think would add value to the decision making that our students have to face as they go through some very difficult challenges. I would also add that uh, career development and career readiness, there is a national study that will be released in a couple of weeks. It's a side by state, com side by side state comparison of the readiness of individuals to select their careers. Alignment with your passion, with your interests, and then the skills helps you be able to make those decisions and choices earlier. And the last thing I'd say would be around keeping college and post-secondary education affordable. The biggest challenges you heard Sherry talk about were maybe not necessarily the tuition, but all the wraparound services. And that's why we're so grateful to SC Johnson and the HOPE program. It included all of those wraparound support services. And I think that's what's a critical missing link for some of the investments that we're making in higher ed. Dr. Ford. Thank you for the question, Chairman Himes. And I, as I think about that, I, I am reminded and really appreciate Sherry sharing her story of that our students bring their whole selves uh, to their campus environments. And as Dr. Albrecht mentioned, the mental health challenges, but many of our students today are not on a traditional path. So they are balancing family responsibilities and workforce responsibilities. And we need to recognize that they have a lot of competing priorities in their lives. The other thing I think it would be important is oftentimes when we think about graduation rates, we do not count every student. For example, when students come from Gateway Technical College to UW Parkside, they are not counted in our graduation rate statistics according to the federal definition. So I would love to see the opportunity for all students to be counted. And we have the highest number of graduates in our history, uh, but our graduation rate continues to lag a bit. And then the, uh, I think the other piece, as uh, Dr. Albrecht has mentioned, is the importance of the federal funding that you support and you all provide for Pell Grants. And I think as we've heard, it is about innovation, innovative partnerships and how we really blur the boundaries between K-12 education, higher education, and with our uh, business and industry partners and really working to provide a pathway for all students. Uh, and uh, so for me, it's thinking about the overall needs of all of our students so that they can be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Sherry has promised. Uh, what, what would have been more supportive, friends and peers that have gone through similar things, what more can be done to support people who, who undertook your journey? 
Well, I think that um, if it wasn't for my office manager, I'm not really sure I would know about this. So getting the word out somehow, because yeah, I don't know if I would have known about it. But I, I also want to just commend um, Gateway too that the they're still giving to me. I have an appointment on the 25th to get my resume updated. Um, they're still helping me, you know, do do these certain things, and it's it's great to have continued help. Thank thank you very much, um, Mr. Ruiz. I I, I want to ask you um, about SC Johnson, but but maybe be a little unfair and, and ask about the private se <coughs> sector generally. Bless you. Um, too often corporations get wrapped up in the political invective and whatnot. The reality is that lots of corporations are doing pretty remarkable things like S.E. Johnson is doing today. And it's an intriguing topic because, I mean, take, take the corporation that's in the headlines today, right, Amazon. Amazon apparently starts people at $18 an hour and has a program to pay for college. However, they just underwent some unionization. And, and, and what you come to understand is that, you know, hours are unpredictable, turnover is high. So I get really interested in what happens inside corporations, not along the lines of traditional philanthropy. I read your, I read your full testimony here, a remarkable amount of philanthropy, traditional philanthropy out of S.C. Johnson. But how do you think about what happens in inside the company because of course when you hire somebody to junior level the more opportunity they have to succeed the better I assume the company is off and of course the better they are off so how do you how do you think about training and investing in employees in a way that in a way that maybe helps this issue of you know taking somebody who is at the bottom of the economic ladder and giving them giving them lots of opportunity great question congressman um, I guess I would start by um, giving a little background on our company um, our, our company has a long, proud history here in, in southeast uh, Wisconsin, going back five generations. It's a family-owned company. Our, our current CEO is a fifth-generation Johnson to run it. Um, and so we have a, a very, very deep connection to, to this part of the country and a great sense of responsibility for the, uh, the associates uh, at our company. Uh, we do invest for the long haul, um, as you said. And... Um, and you're absolutely right that um, that uh, when people come into the company, um, it, is, it just creates a much, much better dynamic all around, both for the employee and the company, to the extent that they are able to have opportunities to grow, to progress within the company, and obviously to, to have um, a great uh, career prospect ahead. Um, we... Um, we invest a lot of money in the community, but also in our workforce to make sure that SC Johnson is a place where they want to make a career and not just hold hold a job. Um, and I think the the success of the company is in very large part um, correlated to, to those investments in our people, in the the, the culture of the company, and uh, and having uh, those synergies created by. Uh, by a, a deep sense of, of community and, uh, and roots. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm out of time. So thank you for that answer. We may come back around to that. Uh, but now let me recognize the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to start with Gateway's journey a little bit. I think it's unique. Uh, started 1911, first publicly funded technical college. It's at a moment of great uh, change in the way that people worked. Uh, people are coming in from an agricultural background. They're coming into uh, the cities that we're seeing in Kenosha and, and probably Milwaukee as well, uh, working in big industrial jobs, very different, had to get different skills and preparations ready to go. We've shifted dramatically uh, the skills and preparations that people needed. Uh, in particular at Gateway, one of the things you noted uh, is career readiness, uh, which really requires you to know what you want to do, right, which is, is challenging for many people, in particular those that are coming out that are less aware of the opportunities that are in front of them. I think before I ran for office, I spent 10 years in the manufacturing setting, uh, and one of them in a large plastics manufacturing facility. Uh, and our HR team, one of the first things they would do to take, would take people who were applying for a job, pre-pandemic in that era, it was over $18 an hour, um, they'd just walk you through the factory. Because most people had never seen the inside of a plastics manufacturing facility. I think in southeast Wisconsin, where we're heavy business to business, a lot of people have just never seen the inside workings of a lot of our businesses. So the, the question, Mr. Albrecht, is when people are coming to Gateway, 
Uh, how many have chosen the path that they're going to study? What Roughly what percentage would be that? Yeah, it's a great question, Congressman. So um, we know that students choose Gateway for a very specific reason. It's primarily the occupational program. They may already have a job. Over 70% of our students are working adults, and they're choosing to either improve their current job opportunity or look for a new opportunity. The rest of our students are either directly aligned with our high school dual enrollment programs, of which we serve over 5,000 high school students, or they come from other sectors of the community, dislocated workers, English language learners, adult basic education. But for the vast majority of our students, they have a career in mind. They choose Gateway to pursue that career. And with our partnership with UW Parkside and others, they can advance it to any level they want to. So we truly believe that just like in 1911, it was a place of opportunity as it is today. They, the, the, the vast majority of folks arriving at Gateway know what they want to ultimately receive their, their education in. Correct. And, and then, just, just helpful, only cognizant of the time, sorry to cut you off. When we look at a lot of those individuals, and they're obviously, many of them would be interested in improving their, 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 their salary or their income uh, at their job. And I think that was some of the story that you shared uh, with us, Mr. Carrion, where you were working a job and you, you noted it made 13 an hour. You, you go, you obtain this, with the hope, of course, making more money on the other side of this, this educational journey. What would be the median wage an individual might come out after, after completing a gateway? Depending on the occupation, healthcare is an example. You can start at $60,000 after a two-year nursing degree. Manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, fifty to 55000 of which we have 20 to 30 openings per graduate. So opportunities are there. I would only add to the, to the reference point that many people come into a career path or a field knowing a small portion of what those opportunities are. So manufacturing, mm -hmm. as an example, we teach welding, we teach computer numerical control, but we also teach industry 4.0, advanced manufacturing, robotics, and automation. And the further you pursue your education, the higher level of income you're going to be able to um, maintain. So we encourage students to look at the pathway, not just the program. Thank you. I'm going to shift over to you, Mr. Ruiz, if I can. I think about the changing work dynamics. You referenced this uh, a little bit. Um, my grandfather started at Wrigley Chewing Gum in 1936, fought in World War II, was given credit for his four years that he served in the United States Army, uh, would come back and ultimately retire on his 65th birthday, uh, 1983. Um, he worked for one company his whole life with, mind you, four years in the United States Army. Um, that was a more traditional path of his generation. That's very different than today. Uh, where many uh, workers will work three to five years uh, before moving on. Uh, speak both for yourself, if you like, but also for the private sector writ large, where an investment in a worker where that worker is going to stay with a company for the duration of their life is a different analysis for a company to make than where that individual may stay for three to five years. How do you, how do you think about that? How does, the, how does the private sector think about that or the company writ large in making that investment uh, not only for the benefit of the company, but for the benefit of the worker. Yeah, th th I think that's absolutely true. Today's world uh, clearly is one in which people have more mobility. Um, people do not tend to stay with one employer for their whole life as they used to in, in previous generations. And, um, and that's one of the challenges that we as employers uh, clearly have. Um, I think when it comes to providing the, the training that workers need in order to succeed, um, our philosophy is that uh, we want to be sure they have all of the tools necessary to, to succeed, and our hope certainly is that uh, once they come on board at SC Johnson, they will be with us for the long haul, and uh, we certainly strive to provide an environment where they, they have opportunities to grow and succeed and, and uh, progress along their careers. But I think there's no question that in today's economy, um, it's less likely that people will stay uh, longer. In any event, um, it only makes sense for a company to invest, uh, invest whatever is necessary for their employees to succeed, whether or not you can control if they uh, move on to, uh, to a different opportunity or not. Um, they, um, we need to equip our workers to, to be able to succeed and perform to the best of their abilities because uh, that's ultimately how a, a company is going to grow and progress and provide opportunities down the line. Thank you very much. Uh, cognizant of the time, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Um, thank you to the ranking member. Ms. Moore is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I do want to thank uh, Parkside for giving us this extraordinary welcoming uh, Dr. Ford. 
uh, and your beautiful students that, and community leaders with whom we uh, had uh, lunch today. This is a very distinguished panel, and I'm so proud uh, of our ranking member for inviting us here to the center of the universe, as I, um, as I call this area. Um, I was born in Racine almost 71 years ago, so I am very proud of this region and very, and a part of uh, a beneficiary, I guess, of the great migration where my parents migrated to this area because of companies like SC Johnson. Uh, I mean, corporate headquarters that are in this region. Uh, my dad worked uh, for then J.I. Case. Um, my cousins have worked at Chrysler. So I've had a bit of cornbread out of each one of your companies <laughs> in my time. Um, I say that to say that obviously things have shifted and the loss of manufacturing jobs has hit this region, including Milwaukee, more, I, I think, than, uh, than any other company. And so the, the aggregation of huge corporations have really created um, a challenge for restoring middle-class wages to people. As I pointed out to our students, my father had a third grade education. It was functionally illiterate, but he had a middle-class job. He had health care. Um, he could walk to work uh, and, um, and sustain himself. And that's a little bit out of people's grasp these days. So I guess one the question that I'd have in this first round, I would give to um, Mr. Diaz, I believe, from S.C. Johnson, as a, as a company that has really stood up, and I, just let me congratulate you on all the stuff you've done, particularly for girls and for STEM. Uh, I also serve not only on Ways and Means Committee, but the Science Committee, and have really been able to provide funding for STEM education, for Hispanic-serving institutions. So I'm really pleased at what you're doing. Can you just tell me what in your calculations um, w is providing the workers with increased s wages and supports as part of your calculation for retaining employees for some of those longer term terms that y you've seen in the past? Um, one of my concerns, you know, I read your testimony where you said we got to have a good tax environment. Agree with that. Got to have a good, fair regulatory environment. I agree with that. But one of the things that we have learned just being here today is that the wages of workers is such that it's it's difficult for them to even take advantage of workplace opportunities that 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 might be out there. So to what extent does increasing wages and benefits come into a part of your calculation? Yeah, that, that is a key part of, of the calculation, Congresswoman. Um, I think if we're doing things right, uh, then all of these factors are working together. Uh, we certainly want to provide, and, and we do at SCJ, uh, provide good wages for good uh, jobs and, and opportunities to grow. Um, ultimately, though, speaking from a private sector perspective, a company can only do that if it itself is growing and, and has the ability to, to sell its goods or services and, uh, and make a return and, uh, and therefore reinvest in, it, in the operations and create jobs and opportunities. I, I, I hear that very clearly, you know, in my last 36 seconds. I guess I don't want to embarrass you, Sherry. But, you know, you have benefited from a collaboration between S.C. Johnson and Gateway, credible organizations. But I, I, and you are in an industry that is growing. Healthcare, there are 10,000 mm -hmm. Americans turning 65 every single day. Caretaking is extremely important. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you're, you're so enthusiastic, if your compensation compares to this, do you have health care? Do you have days off? Do you have vacation? Do you have the kinds of benefits that I think you deserve um, commensurate with your enthusiasm about this work? Thank you for asking, and that is a wonderful question. Um, first of all, I think 
in any organization, the employees are their biggest assets. And um, I am not getting those those compensations. Thank, thank you for that. I my time has expired. I yield back. Okay, we'll go to a second round of questioning. Same thing, uh, five, five, five minutes each, and um, so I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Um, um, Ms. Bloomer, I, I wanted to... Um, uh, ask a similar question to the one I asked about completion rates. Um, I'm familiar with apprenticeships and a big fan, and I, I think it's worth uh, repeating what you said in your testimony here, which is that registered apprenticeships should not be a best-kept secret, and we should have no, no bias against them relative to four-year four -year colleges. Obviously, a lot of the jobs that, that apprentices are trained to do uh, are jobs that can't be exported, um, that provide a, a very strong middle-class wage. So similar question, um, what sorts of com completion rates do you observe in these programs, and what could be done to raise those completion, pro uh, those completion rates? So completion rates vary between pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship, um, and then journey workers. Um, in pre-apprenticeship programs like the ones WR to be big step is credentialed to do, um, retention rates um, usually are around 50%, um, which is not unusual. We actually have people come back several times, on average about two to three times to continue. Um, so eventually we do see higher retention rates. Um, in terms of what can be done, paid training, I think Sherry spoke to that, so that you don't have to make the choice between not being able to work for seven weeks or six weeks during a training, so paid training opportunities. Uh, in terms of WIOA vouchers, the Wisconsin Innovation Opportunity Act dollars that flow through public workforce boards, uh, being able to waive the in-school youth requirements so that in-school youth can be re um, can be eligible for those as well and do pre-apprenticeship trainings while they're in school. So because we know that once students leave high school, whether they graduate or not, it's much harder to return as a pre-apprentice or, uh, or an apprentice. Could you comment a little bit? Um, in your testimony, one-third have been justice involved. I hadn't heard that term before. Does that mean that they've interacted with, the law, with law enforcement, uh, charged, convicted? How, how do we define that? Correct. So justice involved could, do, could be a continuum of having been incarcerated, having had some type of interaction, been on probation, something like that, all the way from youth to adulthood. Um, so we w work with both youth and adults who have been justice involved. Okay, great. Thank you. I just want, um, so um, this is a challenge in, in, in parts of my district as well. What, what are the keys um, in, in my remaining two and a half minutes? What, what, what are the keys or the special requirements that are necessary to take somebody out of uh, incarceration and actually give them a shot at uh, avoiding recidivism and doing all the good things that apprenticeships do for people? Sure. Number one thing that we hear directly from our graduates who have been incarcerated previously is having a real shot at a real job with family sustaining wages when they come back. That reduces recidivism. Many of them tell us directly that if they had not had the supportive services while in incarceration and then had that direct pathway to a pre-apprenticeship or apprenticeship that had family sustaining wages, in their words, they, they would go back to what they knew, um, which is probably what got them incarcerated in the first place. Um, so, so do your programs actually start working with people while they're incarcerated? Correct. Okay. We are able to do all of our certified pre-apprenticeship programs with both youth and adults while they are currently incarcerated. And, and I, I will let you go back to free form, but I, a couple of things I'm super interested in. And, and then how do you overcome whatever stigma or concern a, pros, a prospective employer might have around somebody who is just recently out of, uh, out of jail? So we work with um, employers as well. We work on the industry and employer side and talk about all the benefits of hiring individuals, um, particularly now with such a tight labor market. We have employers who are relaxing some of their um, previous policies around having had been justice involved previously, um, as well as certain levels of educational attainment as well, so they can be making progress toward perhaps a high school equivalency degree, but also be, be employed. So um, really what we're talking about is the return on investment with employers that while they have the supportive services of an organization like WRTP Big Step, that their chances of recidivism or of not showing up, we do all the pre-employment, how, you know, how to set your alarm in the morning, how to make sure you show up for your shift. They have greater rates of ma maintaining that position and also advancing. Say that last part again. Uh, pe people who are emerging from jail who undertake these programs have better rates than people who are not? No, they have, typically, if they did not have any supportive services from an organization like WRTP Big Step, any career readiness, apprenticeship readiness, um, they don't have as good outcomes as those that have the supportive services that were in incarceration 
and once they're released into a position to a job. Understood. Thank you. So just in my last 20 seconds here, so so what's the what's the pitch to an employer? Um, is it largely centering around these supportive services that you provide, and, and what's the what's the deal for an employer here? Sure, it's all about return on investment. That um, I think, as we've heard, that if you can, the costs of recruitment and retention are high, um, and it's and if you could retain somebody who has the skills, who's been trained, who has um, experience, who knows how to access services through WRTP Big Step, that if you take a chance on this person, that their outcomes are better than just hiring somebody off at the street or an Indeed.com, um, and that you'll be pleasantly surprised that they have worked intentionally through a certified pre-apprenticeship program into apprenticeship, um, that they will be a good worker. And in today's market, um, it's much better to you know, do that than have no worker at all, leave that, that space open, or take a shot in the dark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ranking members recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the work you do, uh, Ms. Bloomer. I, in, informative. Uh, the, the chairman took some of my thunder. but So let me, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, but build on what you're saying about this integration. Uh, and ask you, Dr. Albrecht, um, in particular, when we think about integrating our preparatory programs into places where people already are, right? And so that's often your case in the high schools, uh, whether or not it's with employers. I'd love to delve in just a little bit real quickly on how you integrate uh, with local high schools uh, while students are still in that junior and senior year making decisions where you've integrated. Sure, absolutely. We have several different pathways in which we partner with our local high schools. Uh, most of them are called dual credit programs where students can earn credits while they're in high school for their college degree. It's not uncommon for a high school student to earn at least a technical diploma or even an associate degree while they're still in high school. We have over 5,000 students taking those programs. We do it by having new student specialists in the high schools working with counselors, teachers, parents, and students, of course, about their career choice. What have, what have you seen in the, in the cross accreditation challenges uh, where we have the Department of Education involved in the accreditation process? How, how have you been able to navigate that, or what do you see as the biggest challenge with that? Now, that's a big challenge. We provide professional development for our high school teachers and bring them on board as adjunct instructors for Gateway Technical College so that they meet those qualifications. Um, but it's an ongoing process. A school would have to invest in their teacher in order to get those programs accredited. Um, for us, it's been uh, occupationally based, so it's been a little bit easier because we base our certifications on their industry credentialing. So it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge when we start talking about general education as transfer degree programs. Although, as Chancellor Ford mentioned, with our new associate degrees in in uh, arts and sciences, that pathway will be much clearer for students. I, I think there's an opportunity for us in Congress to look at some of those accreditation processes to really help, because I think there's a real opportunity there in particular as it relates to the technical education. Uh, I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask Chancellor Ford a similar question. How do you integrate with the workforce needs uh, in the local community? Yeah. And so how are you integrating in with the private sector? Because there's a, there's a symbiotic relationship between the private sector jobs that are available and the prep preparation work that's being done uh, across our educational system. How do you integrate uh, with the workforce needs here? Yeah, so you, in my testimony, I mentioned that we are working with Snap-on as an example for embedded credentialing, and certifications are a big part of the work that we do. So nearly every one of our occupational programs has some level of industry credentialing. It could be a national certification, it could be a state certification, or even a local certification. By serving on local workforce development boards, economic development organizations, and networking within our community, Gateway maintains over 200 industry partnerships, so we get feedback directly from our employers like SC Johnson on what the technical skill requirements are, and then we can adapt our curriculum. You provide technical training both on your campuses, at Gateway Technical College campuses that are around southeast Wisconsin, but you also provide them... Uh, in the place of employment for some employers? Yes, actually we do. So you can take a customized program with an employer onto our campus and utilize our facilities, or in many cases we take that training right to the employer so that we can demonstrate skills and competencies right on the line that they're working. So it works both ways. We also do that in our Department of Corrections. So we have a training program for the adults, we have a training program for youth incarcerated, and we have a training program for women who then are placed back on campus. I've, I've toured the, uh, where the, the, the training program in particular uh, for uh, incarcerated women here in southeast Wisconsin. Uh, and the opportunities that provides people who've fallen on hard times to get back on their feet uh, as they come out. I think that benefits all of us. Let me shift gears to you, Chancellor Ford. How do you tie out with the workforce needs? We hear a lot of discussion on higher education in particular that often it's disconnected uh, from our workforce needs. That happens uh, on a national scale. How do you address that here uh, locally in Kenosha County? 
Congressman Style, that's a great question, and I would start by saying that UW Parkside was founded for the community by the community, and so it was founded to serve the industry needs of of this part of the state and beyond. And so for us, it starts with building strong partnerships with um, every area of our business and industry community, primarily by creating internships. Uh, they host many of our graduates in real work experiences, and uh, that is something that we are committed to increasing even more of. It's also because our graduates are ready. And we have a number of experiential learning centers here at UW Parkside, let me name a few. The UW Parkside App Factory, the GIS Factory, the Digital Media and Production Lab, um, the uh, SC Johnson Integrated Science Lab. So students at UW Parkside are getting hands-on experiences um, to be able to contribute to what they are learning in the classroom, learning in this environment, learning with our business and industry partners that are so important. Our employers tell us that UW Parkside graduates are ready on day one. Uh, and so that's something that we are very, very proud of. I also want to um, add that business and industry partners serve on our advisory boards and our colleges and on several of our programs. So we are integrated um, and, and really work together to make sure that we have the academic program array that meets their needs today and into the future. Thank you. I, I know I'm a touch over my time if you'll indulge me just for a second because I think it's an interesting discussion here. If, uh, Mr. Ruiz, if you could just comment on how you work with this because I think it's the symbiotic relationship between the private sector uh, and our educational partners here. How, is, how are you or SC Johnson working directly uh, with the local education providers to, to get the preparation that your, your employees need? It is a partnership in every sense of the word. Um, and uh, what my, my colleagues here have sketched out is exactly right. Um, we have a set of, um, of technical requirements, especially obviously for our advanced manufacturing roles um, that we're able to identify and we come with those requirements to our partners and ask for their help in equipping people who can take those jobs and, and succeed in them. Um, it's uh, all of these uh, efforts are, are just great collaborations. There's a lot of uh, back and forth. Um, there's a lot of give and take. Uh, but ultimately, I have to say, it is something that is in the best interest of the company to, to work for it, uh, to, to work towards. All of the investments that we make in, in these job training programs, the boot camps, the, the, the STEM education um, uh, boot camps, et cetera, uh, ultimately are going to um, provide for the success of, of SC Johnson. If, if we are only as good as our employees can be, and uh, and so it's a, a terrific way uh, of demonstrating how the private sector and uh, the local community organizations can, can work together for the common good. Thank, thank, thank you very much. I think there's a real symbiotic relationship where the worker ultimately can benefit if we can provide them the, the experience and the preparation they need to take advantage of some of these higher paying jobs. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, Ms. Moore is recognized for five minutes plus the two that, uh, Mr., uh, that our ranking member just used. So seven minutes total. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. And I just have learned so much from this panel today. And I just want to just once again repeat my appreciation for all of you being here. Uh, we've learned a lot about the importance of educational opportunity in uh, upskilling um, the, the populace for uh, the manufacturers and jobs that are here. I want to ask you, Dr. Ford, um, what you think that the importance of a four-year baccalaureate degree is toward meeting the needs here because uh, in D.C., uh, so often people make it an either-or situation. People think that uh, community college, vocational school is sort of all that people need in order to make it. Uh, and how would that kind of model work for this area? Who would that exclude and what kinds of employers would be left in the lurch? So thank you for that question, and as a first-generation college graduate myself, I absolutely believe that there are many pathways through higher education, and that is the opportunity that we have as educators and leaders today is to make sure that all of those opportunities exist. There are some of us who will start in a technical or community college, and that's a wonderful opportunity. But there are others of us who choose and want to go to a four-year university to earn that baccalaureate degree or to earn an advanced degree. I can tell you from conversations with employers here is it needs to be both and. And I, particularly, we talked earlier about 
the retirement of the baby boomers. Many of those folks are in professional careers, in healthcare, in business, um, in science, in, in elected positions. These are folks who have baccalaureate and advanced degrees. Uh, so for me, I want to be part of, of making sure that those opportunities exist for everyone. And it goes back. When I hear your question, I think about the stories I hear from our over 27,000 alumni, if not for Parkside. Parkside was created from two two-year centers as a feeder to UW-Madison right. back in the late 60s. And for over 50 years, we have been providing what I consider to be high-quality, relevant, and ready graduates. So, Thank you so much for that, Dr. Ford. Uh, you need Pell Grants a lot, right? Absolutely. Um, I wanted to direct uh, another question to Dr. Albrecht, I think, and Ms. Bloomer. Um, you know, if it's true that uh, that an employer uh, that's currently had a contract renegotiated, Foxconn, promised a lot of jobs in this area, pr promised to have a vertical career ladder for people, really extracted a, a lot of public monies in order to build here. Uh, and they claimed that they did not have the workforce that they expected. What happened? I guess I'm asking Dr. Albrecht, Lindsay Flumer, uh, and maybe even you, Dr. Ford, what happened, if, if that's true? I can maybe start, and just a clarification that I'm not speaking on behalf of Foxconn. I'm speaking on behalf of Gateway Technical College and right. our partnership with Foxconn. We have a very strong partnership with Foxconn in that we continue to provide training for the workforce that they need currently. I think that workforce... Um, agenda changed as a result of changing product lines. So the extent to the number of individuals that they're hiring is not nearly consistent with what the original expectation was, but the types of jobs are. So we're training a lot of surface mount technologists, a lot of automation, a lot of business application type pro programming. So I'm still optimistic that whatever comes out of that development will add value to the region of Southeast Wisconsin and put us in a place to be an attraction for future employers because of the workforce that we've been able How to How about the microelectric stuff, the stuff we're doing now? Computer chips, you, yep, anything like that. I think that's the surface mount technology that has been brought to the region, and that's the type of education and training programs that we have partnered with Foxconn on. Fantastic. Uh, Ms. Bloomer. Sure. You know, I think the pandemic laid bare the reckoning of the workforce and what how we treat people in the workforce and how we think about the future generations of the workforce. And I would say generally, you know, globally that the workforce is going to look different tomorrow than it does today and than it did yesterday, and we all know that, but I think really in the lived experiences of the people that we work with at WRTP Big Step, that workforce is not going to be majority white. That workforce is not going to have that straight path from a high school graduation to, a, to a, 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 an, a, an associate's degree or a BA or an MBA, anything. that It's going to be divergent because there are multiple pathways in any educational system, and I think when we have to, we have to look and reckon with ourselves as employers and with with people who employ individuals that everyone has comes to that table with a skill set and it could be a lived thank you set. thank you for the miss bloomer i think i know what dr ford is going to say since i asked her first but transportation we have heard over and over and over again today that transportation is a barrier for low-income people it's a lot of the jobs were created uh, on the i-94 corridor instead of downtown so just the panel generally, to what extent would a huge investment in transportation um, sort of aggrandize the position of low-wage workers to access jobs throughout the region? I'm happy to start. Transportation equals growth. It gives people accessibility to jobs and to housing, um, educational opportunities. We know that in, in our communities we serve we're seeing Kenosha and Walworth County, so we have individual campuses in each region. Still, they could be up to 60 miles away for an individual to take a night course. That makes it very difficult. So I think anything we can do, whether it's transportation in the sense of commuters trying to get from Chicago to Milwaukee and using the resources. We had $700 million for a train, but I'm not going to mention that. Or busing in our cities. All of those add greater opportunity. We do need a regional transportation system. Uh, when I was first elected to the State Assembly as a sweet young thing in 88, 
Um, huh? I put together a regional transportation authority, which was taken down, but this is what we need. And uh, Mr. Chairman, look, I'm going to yield back my 15 <laughs> seconds. Time. See how good I am. Thank you. The gentle lady uh, <laughs> yields. Uh, so we're getting to the end of uh, of our of our hearing here, and I really want to thank our witnesses. I'm going to afford my uh, my my colleagues the opportunity to take just a couple minutes for a final question. I'm I'm going to ask one final question that, if I weren't the chairman, would be way out of line. Um, but I'm going to then uh, ask uh, Ms. Moore if she wants to make any uh, further comments, and we'll close up with Mr. Stiles since we're sitting here in his uh, in his district. Um, one of the reasons I'm really excited about this committee, um, apart from the fact that I, in my own district, uh, it takes me about 10 minutes to drive from inconceivable wealth to very serious poverty, even in Fairfield County, uh, Connecticut, which is known as an affluent place. Uh, one of the reasons I am grateful to serve on this committee is that I spend a lot of time thinking about reconciliation and how we make this country start to feel like one country again. Uh, which isn't about, which isn't about uh, not having political disagreements. It's about having those political disagreements in a way that make us all better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm pretty convinced that economic disparity is one of the prime drivers of the rage that is out there. If most Americans feel like they don't have a shot, that they don't have the opportunity, all of a sudden they're not invested in the system. And it's pretty easy for somebody who's in our business to blame somebody else for that. Maybe it's immigrants, maybe it's greedy corporations, whatever. And, and we get into this cycle of rage. And I heard a story at lunch that this is where, this, where my question veers off into the, uh, into the ungermane. But I heard a story at lunch that, that I'm going to take away uh, that I didn't know before, but that's really important to me and to the country. And the story I heard at lunch was that um, – after those uh, days of rage in the summer of 2020 here in Kenosha, um, I guess it was on the fourth day that people came together to clean up and to work together, black and white, I heard. Uh, I looked on Wikipedia just now. The story's not told. I had never heard that story. I, I watched this all on CNN, and, and yet that story is not out there, that story of reconciliation, that story of the triumph of constructiveness and community over chaos. And so here it comes. This question is not necessarily in the purview of this committee, but I'm, I'm, I've never been to Kenosha so very quickly because I don't have a lot of time. What was it about this community that allowed that fourth day of reconciliation and cleanup to occur? And what lessons can we draw as a country? Let me just, you don't have to answer that question, but I've never been to Kenosha, and so I'm really interested in what your point of view is on that. I would start with, I think it is the resilience of the people of this community. And it wasn't only the fourth day. It happened immediately. People came together immediately because they care so much for each other and for this community. And the key word is community. And I would hope that following this hearing, you will tell that story over and over again about what you were able to witness and learn from the people of Southeast Wisconsin and how we are leading and continuing to build a better place for all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. I think we know something very special here and that is love is not finite, justice is not finite, there's, there's enough for everybody forever and we all share that and we know that we have to perpetuate that and know that you can't take that away from us. We know that here. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'm relatively new to, uh, to SC Johnson, but in my time here and spending so much time here in southeast uh, uh, Wisconsin, I have seen what my colleagues here have described uh, on ample opportunities, and it really is an inspiration to, to, to watch how this community comes together. I would just hope that um, after we heard the story today at lunch that you don't think that's the end of the story. It happens every day. Every day people are coming together in our community to make it better. Whether it's addressing housing issues, transportation issues, educational issues, there is a concerned commitment to making our community stronger. So I think that was the starting point of something that will continue to help build an identity for Kenosha. And I'd like to say I hope that not only did the taste of Kringle stay in your mouth, <laughs> but I'd like the taste of the community to also stay with you and that every day is an opportunity to make something happen. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. 
Um, I was one of the last members out of the chamber on January 6, and that was a day I just never imagined would be happening. A day has not gone by since I haven't thought about how do we make sure we never get to that place again, and I think it is. There's something about that story of Kenosha that, that, that holds the key, so thank you. Very grateful. Ms. Moore. Well, honestly, you sort of teed up the closing remarks. You know, I was in Kenosha those early days after August 13th, and I witnessed you know, that while other people were stirring the pot to continue the rage, that folks were out having fairs, giving free COVID tests, grilling food, strollers were going through here in Kenosha, and it was amazing. And, you know, I was not shocked because I was born and raised in this region, and it's part of our culture uh, of, of, of coming together. I'll never forget, you know, it, that, that Wisconsin was a state that challenged the fugitive slave law when Joshua Glover escaped from slavery from Missouri and went to Racine, Wisconsin, and was captured by the federal marshals and dragged up to Milwaukee to be jailed. And 5,000 citizens stormed the jail and freed Joshua Glover. That, that's who we are. And I told all kind of news folks, that this is not going to stick. The effort to turn Kenosha into the epicenter of racial conflict is not going to work. Wrong spot. This is Kenosha. Mr. Tao. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for holding the hearing uh, today here in southeast Wisconsin. Um, in, in particular, we ha know there's been a national narrative about Kenosha that's unrepresentative of the city itself. Um, and I know that there were three incredibly challenging nights in this city in 2020, not lost on anybody. But what I think is so important is that we take the opportunity to look ahead. And I think that's what we did here today, is we shined a light on what are the opportunities in this area to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to get a good job, a better job, a higher paying job, a family sustaining job. Um, and there's work to be done and far too often uh, the media narrative of Congress is that it's only um, visceral fights. Not that we don't disagree on policy on regular occasion, uh, sometimes viscerally so, but I think you can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, and if we demonstrated something, hopefully it's that, that although we may not always agree on the policy conclusions, there's opportunities to find that common ground, that middle ground, that we can actually work together to actually improve people's lives. And far too often, I think Congress writ large uh, doesn't listen to the American people and uh, really excited that we we're able to spend the day here today at Parkside in Kenosha County uh, listening uh, and I think I'd walk, be able to take back to Washington uh, a lot of lessons about what we can do in particular as it relates to workforce development to make sure that everyone has the opportunity uh, to succeed. So thank you very much Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen yields. Uh, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have 10 legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to the email address provided to your offices. With that, I thank the witnesses again, and this hearing is adjourned.